Hello everyone. Thanks for tuning into this episode of Zero the Educate. Up until the 1990s, the capital asset pricing model or CAPM was the dominant model used to explain market returns. But in 1992, Nobel laureate Eugene Fama and his partner Kent French published their seminal paper which said that market returns can be explained by three factors, namely value, the tendency of cheap stocks to outperform costly stocks, size, the tendency of small cap stocks to outperform large cap stocks and the market, and factor, the risk premium of the market over the risk-free rate like a government bond. Over a period of time, other factors like quality, momentum and low volatility were added. Institutions were the first to adopt factor investing, but with the popularity of ETFs around 2010, factor ETFs also known as smart beta ETFs started becoming popular in the United States. Given that Indian markets are still very young compared to the US, we just had a first wave of factor or smart beta funds around 2017. But in the last 3 years there has been an explosion in factor ETFs and mutual funds. Investors often think of factor investing as a guaranteed way to generate higher returns than the market. They often look at historical returns of factors like value, momentum, quality and low volatility and think that these factor funds will always outperform Nifty, which isn't true. Having said that, factor investing can play a very important role in your portfolio and it's important to know how to use these funds in your asset allocation. This week on the show, we caught up with Shankar Narayan and Krishnan a quant fund manager at Motilal who has rich experience designing factor models and managing factor funds in this conversation we start with the absolute basics of factor investing and talk about two major factors low volatility and momentum we talk about why these factors exist and the explanations return expectations and how to use them in an asset allocation framework this was an absolute masterclass on factor investing and we hope you enjoy listening to this conversation as much as we did recording it we also have an upcoming episode on other two factors value and quality So Shankar thank you so much for taking your time uh, to do this. I'm I'm really super excited about this conversation. Same here same here Bhuvan it's an absolute pleasure and I hope uh, I'm able to contribute something meaningful to whatever you already know and hopefully it's helpful for the listeners as well. Got it. So the overarching idea is uh, like I was telling you before the call uh, there's a lot of nonsense about factor investing there are a lot of misconceptions also. so the idea is to give uh, not just uh, retail investors but also advisors sort of a foundation as to how to think about factors and also dispel all this nonsensical terms like smart beta so that uh, you know they are better able to use these funds in the right way because i think these funds can play a meaningful role assuming that people understand the right way to use these funds in asset allocation sure uh, and given that factor investing is also relatively new in the indian context uh so the idea is to have a wide ranging conversation to pick your brains about it and i'm going to ask you some really really dumb and stupid questions so that uh we get to the uh, the very same questions that retail investors have uh so i hope you'll be absolutely Got it. absolutely absolutely so uh to start up with you're a quant manager at motilal as well so give us a bit of your background so how does one become a quant fund manager right uh in my case maybe purely by chance <laughs> uh Uh, so okay, so what? So I uh, basically an engineer. I went to NIT Nagpur, graduated in 2010. Uh, then went to IIM Indore, graduated in 2013. And uh, so my first job out of campus was this company called IND XX, which is based in Gurgaon. Uh, but it's actually uh, you know an MNC uh, which has its head office in New York, which like a. Uh, small office for uh, you know the partner sit and most of our business clients used to be based out of new york right. uh, not new york but the us and some clients in europe uh, the idea and when i started uh, it was a very small team it was kind of a startup we had around 10 or 20 people uh, the idea was to construct and create some of these quantitative strategies uh, for the us asset management space and mostly the etf community within the us that was about the time when factor investing had started really picking up uh, in the way and form that we know of it right now uh, and this is i think late 2013 early 2014 uh, and 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 i'm talking about factor investing picking up in the etf space that's not to say factor investing was not around earlier it was around in the us earlier but was largely limited to the most sophisticated guys like hedge funds uh, so my role i was Uh, because i was creating these strategies it was kind of a sell side role where we had to do the research create the strategies and then you know eventually someone else would trade on it and from there i 
moved to Morgan Stanley Capital International. Uh, you might know it as MSCI. Right. Uh, so that uh, that's actually uh, so they they made certain very very smart acquisitions where they got uh, a company on board called Bara, uh, which is actually perhaps uh, I I would say in a lot of ways like what. Uh, uh, for the academics, Eugene Pharma is kind of the god of fact investing. Yeah, the for Bara the line of business. Exactly. Right. So, uh, so Bara was actually a hedge fund which was started by a person called Bar Rosenthal, uh, and he was kind of the founding father, the big brains behind uh, democratizing or using factor investing fa- concepts and strategies uh, in a very uh, so that for, for a lot of the investment community at large, right? Uh, so they were, of course. Uh, over there, again, my role was on the sell side. I used to continue to make these strategies. But uh, now I was directly working with the asset owner segment. So I was working with pension funds based in uh, Southeast Asia uh, who would have these factor mandates. I was working with sovereign wealth funds based in Europe who would again have these mandates. And they would have more and more complicated problem definitions, right? So they would say something like, uh, we want to have exposure to these three, four factors because we understand the concept behind it. But at the same time, uh, we also want to adhere to our governmental guidelines uh, that we want to reduce our carbon emission, carbon footprint. We want to make sure that we aren't investing in a company which is gener- uh, like making cluster munitions or any other kind of destructive weapons. So how do you make sure that the returns are not impacted significantly while at the same time taking care of some of these constraints? So it becomes an optimization problem. Right. Right. And as my role as part of uh, as a quant researcher was to solve those optimization problems and then give them those baskets which they could then invest, right? Uh, from there, I came to a prop shop based in uh, Bombay, which is called Alpha Alternatives, where I was running some of these strategies on prop money. Uh, so I had spent about a good uh, six, seven years on the sell side, creating, ideating a lot of these strategies. And I thought, you know what? Uh, I, the, I, I, I have always been interested in the buy side. I have always wanted to take a stab at running my strategies and seeing if I have actually the gumption to go with it all the whole way or if I could, you know, I, I didn't know it. It was like a whole uh, wide space for me. Uh, so I started like that. And subsequently, uh, so at Alpha Alternative, one of my colleagues and friends uh, also knew Pratik Oswal. Okay. Uh, so he put us two together and Pratik, uh, so a bit of his background is that he uh, was in the US, had spent some time in the US where he was working with a company uh, which would sell some of uh, some option overlay strategies, you know, strategies uh, geared towards wealth clients where they would have a portfolio, but they would need to, you know, use options to meet certain objectives. Maybe it is hedging, maybe it is uh, yield enhancement by a percent or so over a year by using the portfolio as margin. And they were able to scale up significantly in relatively short time span. So uh, when Pratik came back to India, he thought, okay, that was that was a segment which could perhaps be of interest. And at the same time, he had also seen the growth and rise of factor investing front and center uh, while he was there in the US. So he thought these were both white spaces. When he came back to India, his first uh, act, course of action was to of course, start up the index funds business or revive it uh, within uh, the company but he always had his eyes out for someone who would also be doing some of these strategies and incidentally i happened to be doing the exact same thing that he was looking for i was using some option overlay strategies i was using factor based strategies combining the two together into some meaningful way at least in my mind and uh, running a book based on that so that's how we got together that's how we came together and then uh, we we started you know so trading few strategies in the Motla Goswali MC setup as well. So that's essentially been my uh, background, how I, I got to where I am right now. And like I said, the first job that you typically select out of campus is not really something you really <laughs> deeply understand. Right. It's a more a crapshoot. So uh, it just happened to be, for, in my case, I just happened to be a quant, uh, maybe a right place at the right time kind of person. So, so that's yeah. what I wanted to ask because uh, like, I, I don't think anybody says in a school when the teacher asks what you want to be in life. I mean, nobody says you want to be a quant fund manager, but that also requires exactly. uh, a lot of quantitative and statistical skills. Is that something that came, uh, you know, throughout as part of your education or is that something you picked up on the job when you were at uh, your first job? So I was always, always interested in math. I was, I always felt that I had a more analytical bent to uh, problem solving. 
uh, I at least if, if that that were not maybe put it other another way I was I I knew for sure that I was in the most creative mind out there <laughs> so <laughs> I I knew my limitations more than my strengths I would say uh, and you know I had passable quant skills I would think also and some of the courses in uh, B school kind of also helped. Uh, you know at least form a basic baseline understanding and in engineering while uh, you you may not really uh, i i definitely don't do anything that most of anything that i learned in engineering but uh, you tend to pick up some key skills like coding you tend to pick up some key skills like numerical analysis and so on which can have broad based applications so uh, when i started uh, at my first job uh, and subsequently from there onwards Uh, i was just putting things in place as they came uh, building on my uh, numerate or analytical capabilities building on some coding capabilities along the way uh, and that was also a time when uh, python was reasonably new but it was re- relatively easy i would say to learn it learn the language uh, and actually start doing most of the stuff that people do in excel it was much easier to do it on python right so initially the idea was never that you want to learn a language because it would help you in uh, your analysis it would help you in your stats it was more because you would take x amount of time doing or running a model on excel and perhaps excel would break and not even able to <laughs> not even be able to uh, help you with what you wanted right and here came something else which was equally intuitive not very difficult to learn you could you know do things which you would otherwise be uh you know taking ages to run on excel and you could do it much more efficiently so that's how the whole learning process of python started and as you went uh, you started interacting with people who were already there in the business who were there around for a lot uh, an extended period of time and those are the guys who uh, you know really told you okay these are the guys whom you need to read these are the things you need to watch out for these are the latest development that are happening in this space so what 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 is your view on these and so that's how it kind of started and mushroomed into uh something where uh, you know over time you read a bunch of papers you start trying out what whatever has been written over there right. trying trying it out in the indian context some of that clicks some of that sticks and that's how you think okay there's something of value here maybe we take it and see where it goes to. so that's i think how my evolutionary phase with respect to uh, picking up quant skills has been the one thing that stands out there is the role of serendipity where in a lot of things just happen right place right time right people so oh yeah so, absolutely i i would think 90% of the whole thing is serendipitous <laughs> got it um now i i want to dive right in you know, to what we wanted to speak about um you know which is factor investing which is also called as smart pita which is a very very annoying term and sort of a pet peeve right. of mine uh but nonetheless right. like ex- give us a sense of what factor investing what are we talking about because This sounds like one of those very very exotic terms, but if you look underneath, it's really really boring. But from the outside, it looks very exotic and yeah, it's made out to be a lot. I think sm- the whole smart beta revolution kind of gave it that exo- exoticism, uh, the mystique around it. Because I, at some level, I feel it was a tactic to attract eyeballs, uh, as opposed to so smart beta is a term which you would hear uh, being touted in the last ten odd years or fifteen odd years. Uh, but that does not mean that factor investing has existed only for the last 15 years right factor has been factor investing has been around for much longer than that uh, and the whole and i agree with you i don't like the term smart beta because when you use a term like smart beta it means there is something called dumb beta but what does that mean right uh, if if someone is investing in the market i don't think that is dumb in any means right. uh, so uh, yeah i think that's also a problem but anyway cutting to the chase uh the whole concept of factor investing started uh back in the 1950s uh so there were these bunch of researchers who uh looked at you know who had access to data and when i say researchers they were you know phd guys uh, in economics uh who who were looking at data and were trying to figure out hey what works in the market like before before 1950 before markowitz came into the picture before some initial model of market was created any return that uh, someone generated right was largely considered to be the alpha that was generated on account of stock selection or allocation by the manager got it for just for context by alpha i mean you know it's outperformance over a chosen benchmark 
Right, but there was no concept of benchmark. Oh, so right. any return that you generated was alpha. Got it. Right. Oh, nice. Uh, <laughs> Listen, it's uh, a very good so environment that, to be a nice yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I I wish I would have been a fund manager back then. Right. <laughs> yeah, but uh, then these guys came about and said, "Hey, you know what? That doesn't seem very likely. Uh, there needs to be. So it's not that the hundred percent of your returns come because of some idiosyncratic risk that you're taking." and it also seems to defy logic right so people started to think of very basic models to think okay what are some of those common attributes that are present across all the stocks uh, maybe in varying proportion but are there nevertheless across the portfolio and if you take exposure to those characteristics or attributes then you are entitled to some some returns that was the genesis of the first model which is called the single index model or the capital asset pricing model or what you may have uh, where what those researchers postulated was that there is something called as market and every and there is something called as market risk to be more precise and almost all equity has exposure to market risk in varying proportions so if you are taking exposure to that risk that is a non diversifiable risk and on account of taking that risk you are entitled to certain returns that was the first model which came about which is also known as capm now and you have the whole famous equation of rm uh, right, right. in rm minus rf into beta plus rf is equal to the returns of the stock or whatever right what it's essentially saying that there is some sensitivity to the market every stock has some sensitivity to the market and the balance is what is the stock specific returns okay. okay so there was still the concept that you know maybe this market this new phenomenon called market is able to explain maybe 50 60% maybe slightly more of the return that was getting generated but there was still a huge chunk called 40% uh, which was down to the skill of the fund manager the fund manager was able to pick the right companies uh, and avoid the bad ones and that's how the excess return got generated that was the belief but uh, people did not stop there when i say people these same researchers did not stop there so the most notable out of those would be a person called Eugene Pharma who partnered with another person called Kenneth French and they came up with so they just kept uh, analyzing the data more and tried to figure out that on top of market are there certain other risk factors which exist and if they do exist what are those risk factors or what are those common characteristics and if i take exposure to those am i rewarded okay which means that they are not diversifiable but so when you say so these were unique traits which could be used to explain that remaining 40% of the returns of the stocks exactly on top of that the market was able to explain got it right so uh, common characteristics across baskets of stocks right. you know and they could be risk characteristics or they would largely be risk characteristics because that was the approach back then right the approach back then was not to try and justify why a factor existed but to try and see if there was Uh, any particular risk that we were taking without really knowing that that was a non diversifiable risk correct and if it's a non diversifiable risk then there should be some return component associated with it to compensate someone who's willing to take on that risk okay so that's how the first two factors which was size which is the ability of smaller sized companies to do generally better than the larger sized companies over a period of time because there is a risk element associated with those small sized companies and the same with the concept of value or undervalued companies doing better or having a premia associated with them over overvalued companies because of a certain element of risk associated with these companies So Eugene Farmer and Kenneth French wrote a seminal paper in 93 uh, where they said that there are two more factors on top of the market and that was famously called the Farmer French three factor model. Right. At the same time again serendipitously uh, there was this person there were two people called Jagdish and Titman uh, who wrote a wrote a paper maybe coming out 6 months later or 7 months later where they were talking about com- something which was completely different from what Farmer and French were talking about. Just something called as the momentum factor, right? Which is again the uh, phenomenon of uh, companies which are doing better in the recent history, continuing their strong performance into the future, into the near future. And companies which did not do so well in the recent history, continuing to continuing their underperformance in the future as well. 
uh, they came out with that effect and or uh, that and they said that this is also a risk factor and there is should be a premium associated with this and th- these are independent researches which have subsequently now converged uh, so essentially the 40 percent of returns which was unexplained right. subsequently with more and more factors coming in that 40 percent unexplained portion shrunk to about five percent to ten percent unexplained returns the balance being explained largely by a combination of various various factors like what have broadly been unearthed. So that's essentially been the evolution of factors, uh, at least from an academic standpoint. Of course, the acad- academics didn't stop there. They had started, uh, you know, mining it to the extent possible because you should uh, realize that ni- during the 1950s or even the 1990s, power first of all, right. getting access to that data right. and low computing power meant that uh, you had to be really judicious with the research that you did. Exactly. Versus now, where if you have any hypothesis, you just need to test it. You just need to code a simple piece on Python and you can test it. And the entire thing is probably going to take less than a day. Right? So, there's now we are now in perhaps a situation where there's an overabundance of some of these factors and there's a paper which was called factor a factor zoo. zoo. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where uh, people are saying maybe there are so many factors that people have unearthed uh, most of them don't mean anything. Most of them are garbage, uh, but you don't know which is which. So, like, what, like, is is that does that mean that the investor is gonna be taken for a ride because everyone is going to have a justification for writing a paper, right? Of course, they got good T stats. Right. Of course, they uh, have some alpha. Uh, of course, they are able to generate out performance. So, anyway, that's uh, that. That's been the evolution. That's been the evolution from an academic standpoint. Got it. To the point you mentioned earlier about. Uh, the notion of something being a risk factor. So for the factors, there are multiple explanations. One, of course, is that you are getting compensated because you're taking some sort of a risk. Correct. So for example, with size, you are buying smaller companies, which obviously have lower liquidity, so on and so forth, which means theoretically you're supposed to get a compensation. Similarly with value, Correct. you're buying cheaper Correct. companies, which are basically your cigar butt type of stocks. So you're getting compensated. Exactly. But is there another explanation because again this is much like economics nobody agrees on any single thing people argue to death exactly. but what are the other explanations for why these factors uh, persist because if these factors have been known since uh, at least the 1970s starting with William Sharp Harry Markowitz so and so forth right. 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 technically speaking like much of the other anomalies for example the calendar effect comes to mind uh, which has been uh, arbitraged away so these factors, okay. if they are continuing to persist, what's the what are the possible explanation as to why they persist? Yeah, so there's there, there are two schools of thought, uh, and a lot of times these schools of thought also coexist for every single factor, right. which is one is the risk based explanation, uh, and the other is the whole behavioral explanation. Uh, the behavioral explanation is a combination of human behavior which has evolved over millennia, uh, and Restrictions which are present with a lot of uh, big ticket investors. When I say big ticket, I'm talking about, you know, a large asset manager. I'm talking about a, a fund which is managing 150,000 crores, uh, whatever, right? Uh, where there are certain limitations with re- uh, that are imposed on them because of the structure that they're operating in, right? All of these get clubbed under this broad definition called behavioral. So let me just give you an example of right. that. So for the momentum factor, right? Uh, so there are two explanations. One explanation is uh, overreaction. Uh, overreaction basically mean, or actually it's the other way around. So there's something called underreaction and then overreaction. Underreaction. You would think okay, underreaction and then you would think overreaction. They are two ends of a coin. But most of the times, the explanation is given with respect to the same company where uh, people, when they look at good news of a company which is perhaps beaten down, a company which was not on your radar. It may not have been beaten down, but was not on your radar. And it's on a radar of a very few set of people. Uh, this initial underreaction is because only few people are buying into the whole turnaround of that particular company. The good news is not priced in completely. So there is a gradual move up. Got it. Right? When there is a gradual move up, more and more people get a chance to look at this and see that they can enter at that point also when the price has already gone up by let's say 20% and the price continues to go up because perhaps that was not the true valuation of that particular company given the good news. Got it. Okay. Uh, now this effect persists for a period of time because this effect persists for a period of time more and more people start getting attracted 
and it goes to the other extreme of it where you have now crossed the fair value of that particular company but people are now overreacting to the good news initially they underreacted to it which attracted more people now because of that attraction it has come to its fair value but now lot of people who are not at all interested in this company have also now started looking at this right right and they keep investing in this company to a point where it's gone way beyond what the actual value or the true value or the fair value of that company should be and suddenly there could be you know some news which comes which you know bursts the bubble so to speak momentum effect sounds like a retail investor <laughs> <laughs> so exactly right so you uh, you hit the nail right. there when you said that it sounds like a retail investor it pretty much what uh, investment is all about at least in the retail landscape right. but i'm sure a lot of sophisticated guys also look at it this right. way where uh, you know because there is this trend which exists uh, why not capitalize on it why not enter maybe lose the initial 20% but enter after that and maybe also take a 20% hit but then exit and basically ride like 60 70% of the upside of that particular company uh, and essentially keep doing that uh, in a systematic manner which over time adds up to your success that's essentially what the momentum effect is about and now this feeds on human behavior which has been shaped in a particular manner right okay uh, this so you wouldn't think that you would think oh this is so silly human be human should change but i'm sure you've been trying to educate investors that this is not the way to invest yeah, yeah, yeah. for a long time and no one better than you to answer that right. question right people don't change their innate behavior innate att- attitude with respect to trading now let me give you another perspective of the behavioral explanation this is more in context of the low volatility strategy right. now a uh, lot of investors uh, especially in the mutual fund space right uh they don't like to so the low volatility strategy typically has a beta which is somewhere around the 0.6 to 0.7 with the with the best one okay a mutual fund manager likes to run a strategy or likes to run their book with a beta which is close to one so just so that they can right. at least keep up with the market and so that they can keep up with the market so their career risk is a lot high exactly. right so if you have a 0.6 beta and the market is just raging then uh, you are underperforming by you know 30 40 yeah, you are under whatever basically uh, exactly uh, as opposed to that if you are able to be where the market is maybe a percent down or a percent up you're still okay because that's where the rest of the industry is also right so uh, because of that they tend to shun some of these low volatility companies and the low volatility group of stocks on average right and that makes them so because you are act someone is there is some segment of the market which is actively avoiding those stocks got it it becomes difficult for that to get completely arbitrage away ah, so the risk sorry the, the compensation is the negligence of those stocks exactly that exactly it's not it's not it so they may know that they're doing it right. but they are still they still have to do it because their mandate is not to run a 0.7 beta Got it. portfolio their mandate is to run a 0.95 beta so these are these institutional constraints on leverage what to buy what to sell exactly these are institutional constraints on leverage now again on momentum the same constraint can be flipped around and said okay you can't take leverage right but let's say momentum gives you a beta of 1.2 right someone who wants to you know just give slightly more enhanced returns without taking leverage this is a better medium for them to do that got it so the, these are some constraints which don't always work in exactly the same way but these are some constraints to keep in mind when we think about factor investing and why the premium has persisted in the market for an extended period of got it this reminds me of this quote by jimo shanasi you might have heard of him he says uh the last right. remaining edge is right. uh, human behavior in the markets because pretty much every right. other anomaly has been arbitrage away uh so so far in the conversation right. you mentioned risk premium uh, factors like value small uh, you know uh, size and momentum so before we go ahead just to give the lay of the land uh, and you also mentioned factors where people are you know data hacking left right and center and creating their own factors so what are those five six standard factors which are widely accepted as having a standard economic rational or a robust economic rational right so uh, the first two are the easiest small cap and value uh, the third one mo- momentum uh, then pharma french extended their three factor model into a five factor model where they said okay we want to introduce two more factors one is quality over junk so they call it uh, conservative minus aggressive and one is uh, strong minus weak or yeah something like that so one is 
to do with profitability the other is to do with investment uh, how aggressively one is investing versus exactly the investment factor so whether a company is investing very aggressively or maybe not investing so aggressively and retaining uh, like giving away most of the retained earnings to the shareholder in the form of dividend or whatever so essentially it's a negative factor so the higher investment is a negative screen uh similar and then finally there is this low volatility factor again the jury is out there as to whether it is a factor in itself or whether it is subsumed by some of these other factors or not uh, what what i like about uh, pharma french at least there is a website called kenneth french data library where they publish this data going back to 1920 i think or 1913 yeah, for the us database. markets yeah uh, so they use the crisp database but then they create the factors oh, in, right 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 uh, and they give the factor returns for each of these factors and they also include the returns for momentum they also include the returns for row volatility despite not really believing that those factors exist for momentum at least pharma premier friends say anomaly. that it's an anomaly it's a pre- premier anomaly we we don't believe in it but you know it exists it's like the elephant in the room you can't do anything about it low volatility they have not given any statements out as such but they've never used it in any of their models Uh, but they still give out the data for all of those so that's the great thing about them so if you if anyone is so inclined to you know actually see how the performance of these factors has been there's someone who's independently publishing this data uh, on a monthly frequency uh, someone can actually go back and look at the return stream look at how the performance of these factors have been uh, over a really long period of time which spans multiple different macro conditions micro conditions and so on and that's that basically a good resource uh, for the listeners i'll add all the links in the date uh, in the show notes so that you guys have uh, access to it. i mean the indian course i think professor jayant verma ha- publishes this on his website somewhere yeah, exactly i'm amdabad uh, right? there's some basic yeah, stats yeah. so he also published it from yeah from right. 94 onwards right. for three right. factors i think three or four got it uh, so you also come from the institutional world in the sense that you manage alternative funds uh factor investing originally started in the institutional world in the sense that it was long used for example you okay. mentioned uh, jagdish statement at the same time i think uh, cliff asnes who's the founder of aqr and also one of the original pioneers of momentum okay. uh, so he okay. was using this in his okay. days in goldman sachs so factors okay. were okay. used uh, earlier in the institutional space but in the indian context at least was it was it the case because on the retail side too factor investing is even till today uh, in spite of being there being the multiple funds it's pretty much non existent was it the case in the indian institutional space also or were factors uh, used more there so the institutional space in india is a slightly different animal as compared to the institutional space outside so in the institutional space for a manager like aqr to come out right so uh, Cliff Asnes, his background was he was at Goldman. He was heading their quant desk, right. and he said, "Okay, I I want to do this stuff by myself." And the three other your colleagues of his and him uh, all together they founded AQR, right? When they founded AQR, there were a lot of clients who uh, were investors at Goldman who were willing to give money to Cliff, and these are not high net worth individuals. Lastly, these were institutions, right? When I say institutions, I'm talking about the pension and the sovereign wealth funds of the world, who believed in uh, Cliff Asnes and his style of investing, and they said, "Okay, the, we are willing to give this guy a shot and give his firm a shot." Right? As opposed to that, in the Indian landscape, those kind of institutional investors don't exist. When I say investors, I'm talking about the asset owners. Right. So the asset owner segment uh, is very limited, perhaps to certain insurance companies. uh who who may be deploying capital for long term investment but you don't have the pension fund you don't have the wealth funds you don't have the 401k's and so on of different companies which get invested in some of these strategies and there is no gatekeeper so right now we have just started with the whole nps where uh you can invest a portion of your uh, overall capital in equities right but that's still a very conservative style in which they manage so we are uh, a ways away from Uh, getting to a point where there is institutional acceptance of factor based strategies in india because i was actually speaking with uh, uh, someone in the in- insurance landscape uh, and even they were not very open to the idea of uh, or they it's not that they weren't open to the idea of using factor but at least they went at the point in time using uh, a whole lot of factors in their portfolio and i'm not even talking about a sophisticated strategy which combines factors in some strategic plus tactical manner 
but I'm talking about even those directional, you know, single factor strategies. Which, Interesting. Uh, so the institutional landscape in India is a bit different. So the client base for an alternative fund, uh, like the likes of which I manage and uh, my colleagues do, uh, the client base is uh, someone who's been a business owner and now wants to safeguard their wealth or grow their wealth. So they have a certain risk appetite and, you know, people like this come together and that's how the fund is formed. So it's more a, I wouldn't call it a retail play, but I will still not call it a pure play, wholesale institution kind of a play, the alternative segment in India. Uh, it's more a, a rich play people. on uh, <laughs> rich people. Got it. Exactly. Uh, in the academic uh, literature, factors are typically defined as long shot. Basically, for example, in the case of momentum, right. you're buying something which has a strong momentum score and you're shorting something which has a weak momentum score. Similarly, for value, you're buying the cheapest quintile or the decile and then shorting the, this thing. But in real life implementation, or at least on the retail side, it's not easy to short things for various obvious reasons and typically ends up being long only factor funds. And of course, like you to your uh, you know earlier point, nobody pretty much agrees on anything. There's a lot of debate about whether if you're long only on a factor, you're getting pure factor exposure or some unintended uh, exposures. But in yeah. your view, does it make a difference yeah. in the sense that if I'm buying a low volatility fund, which is long only and uh, there is no short exposure, uh, is that still OK in the sense that am I getting low volatility exposure? You will get low volatility exposure, but you may also get some other factor exposure which you may not want. That's the point, right? So maybe, so let's say you are an investor who wants an absolute return stream of 13%. Per hour. You will never be able to get that from a low volatility strategy, even if the expected returns of that strategy may be 14%, 15%. That expected returns is coming over a period of time, right? So there could be a year when the low volatility strategy return negative returns. That, that which had got nothing to do with the low volatility strategy not working in that market. Right. It's just because the equity market component, which is 60% of your returns any which way, right. is down by maybe 20%. Right. Got it. So because you have 60% of the market in your long only portfolio, uh, you get to a negative 12% just by virtue of oh, that. Okay. So the market ends up being right. the biggest driver so, of pretty much most of your returns. Exactly, exactly. In 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 all portfolios, right? With respect to whether it's a, it's run by a mutual fund manager, a PMS manager, uh, a quant manager, whoever, right? So if you have a directional exposure to the market which you are not hedging, then most of your returns are going to come from the market. So essentially, you may have a view that the low volatility factor may do well, but you may still see your and your view may be right, your call may be right. You may have taken the right trade, but if it expressed in a long only manner, you may not be able to actually see positive performance. You may be able to see alpha, but negative 12% versus negative 20%, it's, you know, you're not very happy with negative 12%, even if it's an 8% alpha vis-a-vis -vis the market. So that's essentially the... But market. for most retail investors, a long only portfolio still pretty much gets the job done uh, in conjunction with their other investments. Absolutely. So basically, like I said, when you... Uh, if See, if you're trying to be super optimal with respect to trading in and out of these strategies. I don't know how amenable these factor strategies, first of all, are to trading in and out very, very rapidly. Uh, they could be, someone may be able to do it successfully. I have found mixed evidence to be honest. Uh, but if you, if you have, uh, if you are in it for the slightly long haul and you are willing to wait the, uh, wait it out for the odds to work out in your favor, then all of these factors will over a period of time, give you the intended factor ex factor exposure. It may come along with market exposure as well. Okay, just just to be sure, by long term, I'm talking about 15 years and not really the five years, which is the typical long term definition of retail investors. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Of course, if you look at only Indian data, even five years may be good. But, <laughs> uh, that's because uh, long term for India, like the maximum data for India is 15 years. Right. <laughs> uh, I want to come to that point about the long term in India much later in the conversation. Uh, but before yes. that, uh, give us a sense of how the factors have performed in India because uh, pretty much the entire canon of modern finance, you know, is based on Western evidence. But uh, when you import that into the Indian context, has the academic evidence which is evident in the US, does that stick around in India? Do factors work in India? Factors do work in India. In fact, they perhaps work too well oh, okay. for their own detriment because they build an expectation. Got it. Right. Uh, and that the reason why they work too well is not because India is a very different market. I, I don't think that's the reason. I feel that it's because the 
time period in which we are measuring these factors. Most of the factor indices in India start from the year 2005. Okay. Uh, from that point onwards, has perhaps been a good time to be a factor in Western India. Uh, right. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so, uh, I, it's just a, I think it's just a function of the time period in which we are measuring this. Because of which we are getting most of these factors to be overwhelming favorites and like no-brainers for people to put their money in. Right. But if you, if you look at it from a slightly more longer-term perspective, uh, I think... Uh, things may not be as rosy as they seem. There may be periods like when we look at the Western data going back to whatever 1920, right? There may be stretches of seven, eight, nine year periods, consecutive seven, eight, nine year periods when a factor would have underperformed the product. I would have gone to fix deposits, I being a retail investor. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? So, it's, so if it's a risk factor, there is a risk associated with it, right? People tend to forget that in the narrative of, you know, trying to upsell returns or trying to buy into returns. Uh, we, we tend to forget that there is a risk element associated with each of these factors. It's it's not, none of these strategies is, some, uh, is such that you will be guaranteed a particular amount of returns. None of these strategies is such that you will gen- definitely generate positive returns or you will definitely generate alpha in every market. Seven years of underperformance is... Uh, you know, I, I don't think there'll be any investor who'll stick around if there is a seven year right? Correct. But th- that's the nature of this factor. So, and perhaps that is also part of the reason why these factors work because people lose faith in the factor. Ah, the concept of factor owners versus factor renters. <laughs> exactly. Got it. So, you're basically breaking our hearts and telling us there is no free lunch here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so now I want to, so the two factors I want to discuss with you today are uh, low volatility and momentum. Right. Uh, momentum is of course well known. So I'll start with low volatility since there's a lot of, because it's one of those ambiguous factors. And like you mentioned, there's a you know a lot of debate about whether it's a real factor or not. But you know, let's start with the basics. So if you could set some context as to what low volatility is and why does it work, uh, we can start, start from there. Right. Yeah. So it's a very simple factor. Uh, it's basically the concept of buying the companies which have the lowest standard deviation uh, and owning those stocks. We basically, maybe that 20 percentage companies with the lowest standard deviation out of maybe a universe of 200, 300 stocks and keep churning that portfolio once every six months, three months, whatever. Uh, and that historically has demonstrated an outperformance vis-a-vis the product. Industry. But that's the low volatility. But, but the introductory finance class tells us, you know, if you want higher yeah, returns, high but you are saying it's the opposite. Like, how does it work? Right. So the first point to note is volatility does not mean risk. Right. Volatility is one measure of a component of the variability of a particular return stream. Right. Uh, first of all, it does not account for the higher moments. So it does not account for, uh, you know, kurdoses. So it does not ac- account for skewness. So there could still be a, uh, a return series or time series, which is extremely low volatile, but which has uh, very, very sharp uh, tail risk on the left side. Got it. There could be, uh, uh, like the kurdoses of the time series could be, meaning that it's, uh, you know, the tails are fatter. So just to dumb it uh, down, what do, what do means, the tails mean? So basically, if you have a distribution right. right, of returns, you would think that these are normally distributed. Got it. Right? Meaning everything is, you know, equally, evenly distributed on either side of the median. Right. Uh, but a strategy which has higher, or a time series which has higher kurtosis means that tails are thicker. Meaning there are more observations which are found on the extremities. And fewer observations which are found on the ah, mean. So things can go either way in the very extreme on both sides. Exactly, on the extremes. And a tail, uh, a strong left tail means that the maybe the frequency of occurrence of that is very low. But then that, that number, the quantum of that number could be extremely negative. So that's what a left tail distribution means, right? So essentially, uh, volatility, which is measured as standard deviation, is just... The first moment, it is just one measure of the volatility. Uh, yeah, so it's just the measure of the uh, what do you call it, the movement or uh, you know the image of stock price returns and so on. So that 
is equated as risk because it is intuitive oh. because people understand it does not mean that that is risk or that is the entire composite definition of risk that is the first thing to keep in mind uh, when so of course it, it's nice to make statements like you know uh, this is a strategy which gives you higher returns at lower risk i don't necessarily believe that uh, hence i wanted to give out that caveat uh, but having said that for most people volatility is a solid enough measure of risk because we we are familiar with that number we have measured that number for our portfolios also perhaps uh, and we are used to a number called sharp ratio which is risk over returns the return over risk which is basically how much return you are getting per unit of risk right so we are familiar with the terminology uh, we are familiar with what volatility means so essentially the strategy from that perspective what you said is right it basically tries to is slightly counterintuitive in the sense that it goes against what conventional wisdom tells us got it right so why should it work it should perhaps work because typically companies which uh, don't move out so much are companies which are fairly stable in terms of their price uh, and why are they fairly stable in terms of their price was well, also perhaps because operationally they are fairly stable right they are not those companies which are highly variable with when it comes to uh, their business operations uh, they are not subjected to a whole lot of variability on account of externalities so let's say oil price goes up goes down maybe this company is not as impacted if it were impacted that impact would feed into its operational performance which would feed into the stock price performance or the order could be reversed but basically you would see it both ways the fact that you don't see it means perhaps these are slightly insured or inured to uh, you know uh, those kind of uh, movements which happen in the broader business right because of which whenever something drastic happens on the negative side especially these companies tend to fall lesser as compared to the broader market ah, this is the expectations component is baked into the return so that they don't tend to move around much exactly exactly right so because they don't fall down by as much uh, now this is now arithmetic work in your working in your favor right so if it's we give this example but this is actually something playing out in your favor it's like if you are down negative Uh, whatever 10% you have to go up by 11% you are down negative 20% you have to go up by 25% you are down 50% you have to go up by 100% right so just by falling less you don't need to work hard enough to uh, go the entire entire way on the way up you can capture 70% of the upside and you will still be able to generate alpha over the entire time frame got it no that, that is one the, point i wanted to stress on because people don't really get this concept of intuitively uh, this intuitive concept that if you fall less you recover faster assuming you are in a market crash exactly uh, it sounds like a basic concept but uh, yeah i mean yes yeah, sorry please go ahead yeah no absolutely so that that's essentially what it is right so uh, uh, we looked at data going back to 2005 right, right? when for, for the period for which we had this data and we identified all these crash periods and we averaged out the returns on the downside as well as on the upside Uh, of the crash periods and what we found out was essentially this that uh, it consistently falls lesser than the market during the downside correct it also rises up lower than what the market rises up by during the upside correct but when you combine the two periods this factor turned out to be much better because the the low volatility factor over the two periods put together the downside as well as the subsequent upside put together is able to do better than the market in i think there is some seven or eight uh occasions which were illustrated and in each of those seven or eight illustrations we could see uh you know that this kind of performance working out in the investors favor got it so Now, there's this line or eight data point sorry there's yeah. this line called or rather this quick called winning by losing less i guess this yeah, kind of well. makes got it yeah yeah that so uh, again i uh, like being a quant i have to be a bit Uh, you know, uh, when 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 I tell you when I tell you something as a fact and I present to you that I have based it on eight data points, then I am cursing myself because you know that's not statistically significant or long enough a data series. But the data is what it is. So uh, if we have more data, maybe we can do more granular analysis. But unfortunately, based on the data that we have, this is what it looks like. Uh, it on average, this is how it should work. Again, let me. Uh, caveat it a bit and say on average this is how it should work does not mean that in every single crisis it should work that way oh this is what makes quant so unhappy people because you don't have enough data points i'm guessing <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> got it uh, just to the point about uh, crashes so how did low volatility perform during the uh, covid crash because 
Uh, for example, I'm a millennial and I haven't seen a proper market crash. 2020 was supposed to be one, but we got lucky. So assuming that yeah, I was a low yeah. volatile investor, how did I perform during that crash? So you would have done well in COVID if you were an Indian investor right. you know, on low, uh, in a low volatility strategy. You wouldn't have done so well if you had been a US investor investor in the low volatility strategy. Oh, interesting. Uh, uh, which is, you know, I think a bit weird. Uh, also, perhaps because low volatility as a factor had become hugely popular in the US. Uh, so that some of the factors which worked in the favor of the low volatility strategy perhaps were not true entering into COVID, right? Uh, and I'll get to that in a bit. In the Indian context, of course, you would have done well, uh, no question, uh, right? Because Indian investors typically, uh, we low, there, there was perhaps one fund which was giving us exposure to the low volatility right. strategy. I don't think any of the guys who are doing quant even in the odd space and honestly the odd space is not big enough to really make a dent but even in the right. uh, size that it is there are very few guys who do quant and even the guys who do quant I don't think they use low volatility right so uh, they very rarely use it so uh, I I would uh, I don't think uh, it was a popular strategy at all in India going into COVID and hence you would have done well. Uh, I don't have the numbers on the top of my mind as to how much better you would have done, but you would have fallen lesser definitely. I think uh, uh, around so versus the mac- market returning around thirty percent negative for the quarter Jan to March, uh, you would have as a low volatility investor maybe around eighteen twenty negative for the quarter. So that's about ten percent better than the market. I if memory serves right, uh, I think no, that's, that's. I mean, even if you're you know relatively close in the ballpark, that is. Still a very, very good outcome. Yeah. 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 Uh, I just want to pick up uh, back to the other point you mentioned initially, uh, which is why, what makes lower volatility tick. So one is that these tend to be relatively stayed and storage stocks in the sense that uh, people know what uh, they are getting out of the stocks, which means the market would have pretty much discounted all the extremes or rather outlier events. Exactly. Uh, is there any other explanation which explains why this uh, and, and low volatility Along with being called a factor, it is also labeled as an anomaly. So, Correct. are there any other explanations as to why this anomaly persists? And it has persisted. Up, uh, no. For example, uh, the Robeco guys, Pim Van Vlaen, they had put out a paper which said some 100 years data, which is actually quite yeah, crazy. Yeah. So, what makes this yeah, yeah. Uh, anomaly persist across this uh, such time zones? Yeah, I think uh, two, three more, which I are, I think, con- conceptually or uh, structurally similar to the whole uh, baking in expectations argument, but there's a lottery ticket effect, right? So low volatility stocks are the opposite of the lottery ticket stocks, right? So people typically want to uh, buy a lottery ticket stock because you have a chance of being a millionaire uh, overnight. Uh, whereas with respect to a low volatility stock, that's pretty much impossible, right? So no matter right. like which stock you own, there's a like almost zero percent chance that you'll become a millionaire overnight if you just own a low volatility strategy. Right. So it's uh, shunning the low volatility segment of the market in favor of the lottery ticket segment of the market again goes down or boils down to human bias or preference for one type of stocks versus the other. Uh, Then there is the third uh, baking in expectations, which I think you very nicely put, which is, uh, you know, uh, with Nika, I think uh, there was some analyst who was was Nika IPO. I remember. Uh, Some analyst which was... uh, Forecasting 40, 50 years of uh, growth right. at 20% CAGR or 30, 50, whatever. You, you don't right, know about right, the CAGR right. next year. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, in their wisdom, they did it. But the point is in a low volatility company, you will not do it. And even if you do it, you are going to price in at uh, inflation plus 2% kind of a rate. Right. So the surprise on either side is not going to be too much. Got it. So that's, I think, uh, different explanations to the same. And then I told you the institutional... Uh, uh, what do you call it? Lack of ownership of these stocks, Got it. which means that at some level they will persist to, or uh, they will slightly be uh, undervalued with respect to their peer set, which is slightly more higher beta in terms of. Uh, and I, I, I want to use these terms carefully because when I say undervalued, I don't mean that they would be uh, trading at a 10 p or a 5 p. I don't. Or rather, under owned uh, would be a more better explanation. I'm guessing. Under owned, exactly. Got it. Exactly. That's right. oh, this lottery explanation is actually quite intuitive. So just for my understanding in the sense that, so I'm buying high risky stocks in the hopes that I get to hit it out of the park, which means exactly. these other stocks tend to be low, you know, uh, under owned, which means my expected returns go up because nobody cares about these stocks. Exactly. Uh-huh. exactly. Exactly. Got it. Got it. And if you're a, if you're a major fund manager, again, you are owning your higher beta names as compared to your lower beta names. So again, there, the expectant, expectation goes up. Uh, 
uh, and so it's essentially it's all under owning these stocks because of which their expected returns go up either way the over owned stocks it's basically the argument got it and to the uh, at the beginning of the conversation you alluded to some debate over uh, low volatility whether it's actually a factor or it could be explained by something else and just before this conversation i was just you know looking at some of these papers which also kind of alluded to the same thing saying that about 60% of low volatility returns can be explained when it's in the value regime and about 40% could be explained uh, by exposure to growth stocks and of course there are big other papers which say it's the exact opposite so in to mm-hmm. your mind as a quant when you look at all this data do you get the sense that it low volatility is you know like a persistent factor that could you know people could get exposed to or you know you're also sat on the on the fence about whether it actually being a factor or not uh, so very great question honestly uh, uh, yeah especially with respect to the low volatility at least personally i found lot of similarities with quality okay in terms of the behavior um and i felt and so i of course look up to aqr a lot i look up to the research that they put out and betting against beta how they uh, exactly so what they are doing is that while they use low volatility as a betting against beta kind of a factor they are uh, combining all of those together into a broader factor called qmj which is quality minus junk right. uh, or at least in that paper is when they wrote all this and i Uh, I felt that that was a nicer way to look at it because it, at some level, also talks to the quality of a particular company. Going back to one of the reasons which, because of which I like the low volatility factor, is the whole state nature of the company and the stock price itself, which perhaps is also true of a quality company, a company which has high consistent profitability. Perhaps not the most exciting company to be owning, but perhaps gives you a lot of downside protection because of whatever expectation, expectation which match and so on. So. Uh, personally i i prefer using low volatility as a sub factor within the broader quality umbrella along with profitability along with investments uh, but there are people who use it on a stand alone manner uh, it's and there is lot of uh, it's an overused term but devil is in the details in whenever you are creating any quant strategy or reading any paper right so you will see two papers Uh, which is uh, both of which are ta- tackling the same subject which is is the low volatility factor a factor in itself or is it subsumed by some of the other factors they will be doing the same analysis of a pharma french five factor regression and both of them can come up with completely different uh, findings so one paper can say hey the alpha is actually shrinking to be statistically insignificant once you account for the five factor exposure the other guys can say no it continues to remain the same now these are two ends of the coin right. to uh, you know think about but uh, you know there's no consensus because at some level maybe the construction maybe the cut off date that they took some of the thing that they leave out when they uh, talk about how they created those factors and all all of those things come into play what universe did they use in constructing uh, while most of this is clear some of this is also left to the readers imagination and lo- most of those things can also contribute to a huge difference between whether a factor is relevant and whether it is not got it as a practitioner you want to just uh, improve your signal to noise ratio to that extent if you uh, if you feel that a signal has uh, any potential signal adds meaningfully from an intuitive standpoint as well right going beyond what the numbers tell you going beyond whether it adds alpha by 200 bips or reduces alpha by 150 bips whether it's adding intuitive sense whether it is making your signal more robust overall you are happy to take exposure to some of these at least when the ones which are on the fence but broadly accepted as opposed to something which is very niche where there is only one paper in the entire world which is talking about it i i would be a bit circumspect about using something like that but with something like low volatility you are happy to you know, include it in your process I want to come back to two points you made about construction and the you know devil being in the details but before that so this is going to be a really dumb question so let's say for example I am taking exposure to some factor let's say call it value so does that mean assuming that I build a basket of value stocks I am only getting value exposure or could there be other factor exposures also there could be uh, market factor exposure is definitely there uh but there is a less chance that you will have exposure to factors other than value got it you may have some stray exposure which is okay but uh it you will still get statistically significant exposure to value which is what you're going for so that that is how it would be and the nature of these factors which goes back to the research right originally 
if you found out that there were two factors, okay, let's call it factor A and factor B. Right. And both of these factors essentially had a lot of overlap in them in terms of the exposure, in terms of their characteristics, attributes, performance, this, that, all that. Why have two factors? Have only one factor, right? Exactly. So the whole reason why you have five, six, seven, eight commonly accepted factors is because each of those brings about a certain distinction to the broader table, which is not explained by the combination of all the other factors put together. Ah, uh, okay, got it. And hence, some correlation benefit is uh, gleaned when you incorporate or include that factor in your overall portfolio. That's essentially the way to look at it. Got it. And to the point about construction, so uh, I was looking at the indices from Nifty and S&P BSE. And there seems to be some difference in the performance. Uh, so, and it, again, this leads back to the question, uh, because if I'm an investor and if two volatility indexes or funds are giving disproportionate returns, it could mean that there are various construction approaches or, you know, they, I don't know, maybe something else could be happening. So if I'm an investor, what am I looking for? Because to take a US example, which comes to the mind, there's, uh, there's a low volatility approach and I think Invesco has this minimum variance fund or something like that. Minimum so correct. basically you're slicing and dicing things in multiple ways. So if I'm an investor allocating, I assume I'm a re- dumb retail investor. So what should be the things I look out for when I'm picking out a fund? So um, low volatility in the Indian landscape, right? Whether it is NSE or PSE, performance different not standing. Right. Broadly uh, have similar approaches. Slight differences. Maybe I have started the starting universe. Measure volatility. Maybe someone does it based on three years data. Someone does it based on one year data. Uh, and basically rebalance. Someone does it in March and September. Someone does it in June and December. Okay. Oh, okay. So those differences may be there. But broadly, uh, the factor characteristics should remain the same irrespective of the two method of which methodology you choose out of the two. Correct. Uh, which does not mean the returns will be the same. The returns will of course be different because you get different companies in any given quarter, the returns are not going to be the same. But uh, over a period of time, I think it will average out when in some quarter, some stock does well, some portfolio does well, the other quarter, the other portfolio does well. So you should be reasonably okay uh, choosing one over the other. Um, The minimum variance is going one step further. Uh, What it also does is it basically says, okay, let us now we have selected stocks, but instead of simply weighting them based on some, you know, naive methodology. When I say naive, it means something like an equal weight, something like uh, market capitalization weight, uh, or even something like inverse of volatility. Basically, the highest volatility getting the lowest volatility getting the highest weight. Uh, this is going one step beyond and saying, okay, I have a basket of these low volatility stocks. Individually, they contribute certain volatility, but at a portfolio level also, because of the correlation or the covariance that exists between each of those companies, there may be benefits that accrue to the investor by owning two companies which are less correlated among themselves, which may independently be higher volatility. They may not be the lowest volatility names, but on combining the two, you may end up getting a portfolio which has much lower volatility. So the minimum variance approach is not a selection approach as much as it is an allocation approach where you basically look at all the companies which are there in the universe. You try to construct a basket where the uh, like the expected variance of that particular basket, you're trying to minimize that. So the optimization problem over there is to minimize the risk of the efficient frontier. Got it. So basically the portfolio on the efficient frontier which has the lowest risk. That's essentially what is getting. But the problem with Using a minimum variance approach is again, it's backward looking. You are trying to estimate a covariance matrix. You're trying to estimate a, uh, you know, expected, expected returns doesn't matter. You're trying to estimate the covariance matrix, which comes with, with its own, uh, you know, pluses and minuses. And at the end of the day, it becomes a black box because uh, you don't know uh, how it is, uh, how the model is or the, or the algorithm is treating two companies. Uh, essentially, you feed in all the data and a portfolio comes out can actually and it's an iterative process which is followed right because there is no closed form solution right. for the problem so you have to keep running uh, in order to solve the problem you have to keep going in increments of whatever iteration and basis that you get whatever is the minimum volatility you pick that combination okay, okay. so because of that the process becomes bit more opaque and so it's that, that's not to say it's not standard it's just that 
someone someone who is in trying to invest into or evaluate the strategy should know that this is something which is also going on under the radar so the fund manager themselves may not know why a particular company is coming <laughs> beyond the fact that you know it is coming in because of some reason but you know uh, you don't know and plus uh, the whole problem of estimating estimating the covariance metrics is uh, something which is there are a lot of shrinkage techniques and now people are estimating factor covariance metric they are not estimating the individual stock covariance matrices uh, so there are people people have done a lot of good work there but all of these are things which a retail investor may not really understand Sorry. so uh, for someone who's pure, simply looking to take exposure to you know the lowest volatile stocks uh, and keep aside the interaction effect between the stocks themselves i think uh, the approaches that are available in india for now should be reasonably okay Correct. once we get to a more evolved stage as investors where we understand the low volatility factor in itself perhaps the optimization piece can then come in. Correct. uh i'm going to put you on the spot now so uh, assume that something were to make the low volatility factor disappear apart from perfect human rationality does anything else come to mind because if i am allocating money it's also uh, good to make uh, you know peace with the worst possible outcome and this will also come back in the later questions because we have seen this with value investing in us so and so forth like what can make this low volatility anom- anomaly disappear does anything come to mind uh because most of the reason the behavioral then the re, uh, reason why it should stop working should also be that you know humans start investing as robots uh, humans don't invest in individual stock they invest in strategies and the uh, even then it can persist right because there is always a strategy like an arc fund which is uh, investing in the highest growth companies yes, right. so there is always someone who is a counterbalancing force which is what the low volatility factor is when it will stop working could be for brief periods of time in between where what may end up happening is you know you may uh, end up investing in the low volatility strategy uh, so much because lot has been sold in the marketing material saying you know this is a fantastic strategy it doubles the sharp of the benchmark it's uh, you know dead plus plus kind of whatever people <laughs> say a lot of things and some of it could be true i i don't know if all of it is true so uh, at that point in time everyone loads into the trade the data for the last whatever time frame looks good right now while in its nature the strategy does well because the expectation is of stayed performance or whatever so there is an expectation mismatch you are not owning it but all of a sudden now you are owning the basket completely whereas you may not be owning the stocks and suddenly there is a crash that comes in which is what happened in covid in the us the low volatility was a pretty popular factor exactly. right a pretty popular fund and all of a sudden uh everyone has bought it now the valuations aren't as attractive as they would otherwise have been or the expectation isn't as low as it would otherwise have been now all of a sudden uh, reality strikes and then you know the bursting of the bubble so to speak leads to some problems with the low volatility factor also so something like that can and that also works from someone who has a long term game to play in this that these are the times when people will stop like start losing faith in the factor because if a low volatility factor does not give you performance that it promised during covid then when is it going to give you performance right or that's the question people would ask so people may start ditching that factor and that factor may again start coming into vogue maybe the next time there is a crash because at that time people perhaps remember the last time and they don't invest in the low volatility factor anymore and then it starts performing and they again load on to the factor so those kind of cyclicalities i think they are part and parcel of the game Uh, but yeah, that's that's something which uh, I'm not scared about. I I kind of expect that that's how it would be. Uh, but that's also something to you know if it if it becomes too popular, also too crowded a trade again, it becomes a problem. Got no, I think that is especially relevant for retail investors because they are they tend to be pro cyclical in the sense they load up just when the factor is getting popular, or rather even some fund strategy is getting popular and then Correct. abandon it in the pits of despair. uh so the message clearly is to just stick through it give it time to work so that you have some reasonable chance of uh you know harnessing the this thing exactly. the next factor uh, which is actually it's relatively a little more popular compared to low volatility at least even in the indian context because in the last call it 4 or 5 years the markets have been phenomenally you know doing well phenomenally so momentum was kind of in the vogue not just in mutual funds but also outside uh, you know in other rappers So, but but you know, just to set the context, tell us what momentum is. Like again, why does it work? What makes the factor tick? Yeah, so momentum is uh, very similar to low volatility. 
utility no in terms of the fact that it's uh, also completely dependent on the price right of uh, uh, the stocks uh, although there are certain guys who measure momentum in other ways they may be they may be measure momentum using uh, you know earning momentum right and so on but momentum basically go back to the physics concept right so if there is something which is in motion ah, right uh, the newton has postulated that it will continue to be in motion unless there is a strong external force which acts against it Right. Right, right, right. So the same concept applies to a stock, where if there is a positive sentiment associated with the company, it keeps on going up until there is something which stops that. So your objective is to ride it on the way up to the extent possible and cut your losses short as soon as you see the reversal. Correct. So how do you do that? You typically do that by measuring historical price performance. Someone can just look at point to point data uh, for the last six months, last three months, last twelve months, whatever. people can look at more granular data people can look at you know crossovers and things like that uh, and these are things which a uh, lot of retail investors also familiar with right uh, when when they do some form of technical analysis uh, but that's essentially what it is all about it's basically <coughs> i'm sorry what is the actual return that a particular stock has generated you rank all companies basis in your cross section basis this parameter and basis that you select maybe the top 10 percentile 20 percentile companies which have generated the highest moment uh, which have given you the highest returns got it so why does this thing work again much like you know low volatility what's the economic rationale behind why this things work yeah i think the number one reason is the whole i think we spoke about it earlier the whole under reaction and then subsequent delayed over reaction so it's basically you under react to good news uh you think that the good news is not good enough but then that gives enough people a chance to load up into it as more and more people load up into it uh it the it creates a self fulfilling prophecy also yeah it becomes a self fulfilling pro- prophecy it goes beyond the fair value once it goes beyond the fair value the external impetus here is some adverse news so let's say there is a positive sentiment that is associated to the company okay that positive sentiment can actually lead to improvements in the performance of the company operationally also because now all of a sudden fundraising for that company becomes easy right. earlier maybe it was grappling with some issue and suddenly you know the stock price has gone up so now the value of the stock or the uh, holding is higher because of which now they are getting some new lines of financing because of which the operations are more stabilized and all of those things can happen but there will come a time when you you were predicting some percentage of growth and that percentage of growth is not realized right a much low you know something completely out of whack or maybe even are a, yeah expectations are broken when the expectations get broken that is when things start crashing and things crash down in a very rapid manner uh, so the idea is you if you do it with one stock you are bound to you know end up with nothing got it but if you do it with a portfolio there will always be some segments within your portfolio which will you know still hold up because the story is not completed over there and the other segments of the portfolio which do go down you cut your losses short as soon as you see the first sign of something like this happening and then you move into a fresh set of stocks that again start exhibiting this kind of positive sentiment or momentum so that's essentially the idea uh one thing to note about particularly with low volatility uh, with momentum as a uh, strategy but in general for all quant factors quant models or uh, strategies is you know when you pick a 30 stock portfolio right you're never picking that 30 stock portfolio with the objective that 30 out of those 30 are going to be winners right right which is slightly counterintuitive to how a more discretionary manager may pick stocks right high conviction so for, bets <laughs> exactly high conviction bets i have 30 stocks i believe all of them are going to go up by 10x 20x whatever that number is right, right. uh and they hold it for a period of time and whatever you have to accept that your hit rate is going to be perhaps just above average it's going to be about 55 56% wow seriously uh, maybe 60% yeah i i would think so right uh, on average you it would be somewhere around that well uh the contribution of returns from the winners is going to be slightly more than the contribution of losers over time on average Right. So that is where your alpha is getting generated, or returns are getting generated. Got it. And if this happens consistently over time, you build into it, and then over time you make returns. That's essentially what. Uh, so someone should definitely keep this in mind because a lot of investors who are investing in funds, right? Uh, they are not. They may be used to seeing negative performance, but they are also hoping to see a positive rationale for a particular company being there. Right. Whereas you can see an absolutely trash company uh, <laughs> being a part of your momentum portfolio because just because of the fact that its price performance was phenomenal. Right. 
so yeah got it so momentum ignores the other factors and purely looks at price so that you don't so in the sense that you have to have the guts to ignore probably positive or negative fundamental news and just solely focus on price exactly so at least the fund only looks at price it doesn't look at anything right, right, right. as an investor who is used to looking at the portfolio of stocks that are owned in the fund uh you are uh how do i put it your uh, temperament comes into question right uh because as a investor let's say you are an experienced investor and i think momentum is a strategy more amenable for an experienced investor rather than someone who is stepping into the stock market for the first time right right so for someone like that who is used to looking at their portfolios for someone like that who uh, used to tracking companies who used to talk to fund managers and so on a low volatility portfolio may still be okay right because the low volatility the companies you will see will be very very defensive in nature so you know that these companies are not going to go away anytime soon at least you feel that you feel comforted by that in a momentum portfolio you may see companies coming in going on first of all the churn is higher second of all it's also some of those companies may be absolute <laughs> you know bonkers and you Uh, you 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 would not touch it with a stick, right. and all of a sudden you have that company in your portfolio. So those kind of things can happen. So it becomes difficult to stay the course with something like momentum, uh, as at least the purest form of momentum, the way it is measured. So, so one. in a way, at least on the downside, momentum is the inverse of low volatility. Because if you were to look at drawdowns, and by drawdowns I mean the percentage of falls that a momentum strategy can have, it tends to fall. Actually, it falls more more than most of the other factors. so is right. that the reason why i'm getting compensated or rather one reason why i'm getting compensated for that could be one of the reasons why because you end up taking a higher beta exposure in a market where uh, you are innately you are higher beta in a down market right. so that is a additional risk that you are adding on to your market risk for which you should get compensated if you look at it from a more first principles approach right uh, for the momentum factor uh it's a it's a it's a tricky one because if you know uh, your downturn is slow and steady but it is there for sure if it happens over the next one year but it ha- happens right the momentum factor can actually may actually not be so bad for you in such a market because what it ends up doing is it ends up picking the relative out performances out performers in those markets oh ah, okay which could be some of the lower beta names hey. right the problem with momentum is not a trending market the problem with momentum is a market which switches the trend got it so let's say you uh, you know you are in a uh, you know a secular bull market and all of a sudden you see a crash maybe this current market phase current market exactly where you were seeing 2020 2021 it was a one way market right. and all of a sudden from and especially in the it names right and all of a sudden you see the it downturn happening in a very very huge way right uh the momentum factor would have gotten hit by it significantly got it. whether it will continue to get hit is anybody's guess because if you look at the most recent momentum index portfolios yeah, yes. you'll see that most of the it companies have gone out right got it right so now again if there is a reversal from here where it is now starts to go up again uh, what was 25% of the book was now 0% of the book Uh, and those companies which perhaps go up by ten percent, as for the market goes up by two percent, momentum is not going to capture that upside either. Got it. So, and it it gets worse if you run it in a long shot book because you would essentially short the IT names, right. which would perhaps go go up by a lot. So, uh, momentum is a very difficult factor to you know trade in a long shot manner. In a long only manner, it's still okay. Got it. So, I mean this. this kind of makes clear that that short quip no pain no premium uh, i guess yeah absolutely got it and you know the, much like low volatility uh, there might be or there are various implementations of momentum for example the academic uh, literature says 12 minus 1 if i'm not wrong and Correct. most of the indian indices follow a 12 month and a 6 month ranking system so just just you know dumb it down and you know explain how are these indices you know uh, constructed and then if i as a retail investor was absolutely no uh, rather yeah, i'm not a quant so what am i looking for when i'm uh, allocating this funds uh, rather the red flags that i should keep in mind right so the 12 minus 1 comes from the whole philosophy of a uh, lot of these guys observing a short term reversal in stocks so you want to take out the performance in the most recent month because that could be on account of something which has gone up which will reverse in the subsequent months 
so you don't want to own that so you eliminate that out so there's a now there's a debate as to whether the reversal effect has been seen or is statistically relevant in all markets with it and it's a microstructural issue i would think uh, you know microstructural meaning uh, it could be down to human behavior as to you know a lot of the guys who are doing more short term shorter term trading uh, they would be incentivized to you know book their profits as soon as it's realized and not hold it on for a longer period of time Uh, so that's where the twelve minus one comes from. I think most of the guys also use twelve minus one, the index guys. Right. Uh, but what they do is they scale it down by volatility. Ah, okay. Uh, so that's they. I think they're trying to do a risk management within the signal, just to make sure that <clears throat> if there are two companies which are you know having exhibiting the same kind of momentum, but there's one company which is doing so by taking on much lower volatility, so it's much smoother in its uh, movement as compared to the other one. Uh, so company which goes up by 50% and has a volatility of 40% the 50% could just be you know normal gyration in the stock price performance because the volatility of the company itself is 40% right. but as a company which goes up by 40% with a volatility of 15% that's that gives you a lot more conviction so it i think increases the conviction of the signal so most of the index guys do it like that it perhaps works uh, also slightly in terms of Uh, improving the risk characteristics of the companies because some of the companies which may be uh, you know trading on very thin volumes will have very high volatility so right. you are perhaps also not comfortable owning those companies in your portfolio but purely by looking at momentum they may be crazily high but if you adjust it for the volatilities maybe they go down slightly so as a result so that's how the guys constructed now some guys use 6 month versus 12 month some guys use 12 month honestly i don't think it makes too much of a difference so in the long run it all uh, evens out in the long run i i would think it would even out the i i i i don't think from a statistical significant standpoint there would be any difference between the two uh, that not to say that one won't generate more right, returns right. as compared to the other got that can always happen but on the on the face of it this sounds like a really dumb strategy you're just buying winners and cutting short in losers exactly, exactly. so that, i mean why is it why hasn't this been arbitraged away i mean uh, and also momentum tends to be a higher churn strategy compared to other factors right so that and and which means there will be more costs more taxes does this thing still work after accounting for all those things so interesting thing is so the momentum paper by jagdish and tritman came out in 93 and if you look at the data from 93 onwards for momentum there is still a 2 3% edge annual alpha that the strategy is generating versus the benchmark okay. right so over the last 30 years it has generated close to 3% percentage alpha per annum which amounts to a huge number now uh, you can make this argument that you know you should the strategy should have been diversified away by now right uh, but i think it again goes back to uh, the whole hypothesis of why it worked right why, why it worked in the first place where perhaps people don't follow it systematically enough perhaps uh, and the first thing is you know when you talk about momentum as a strategy you you made the statement yourself right it sounds like a really dumb strategy why do you want to so it's the exact opposite of buy low sell high uh, it's maybe buy high sell higher <laughs> or whatever but it's definitely not buy low sell high and the, the who's who of the investment world uh, maybe not the who's who but at least the guys whom most of the people would like to hear uh, the warren buffets of the world have really uh not had many kind things to say about the modern strategy it's one of those things right. strategies which brings out the most heated debates in modern finance or at least i can think of exactly and it's a difficult strategy to stay the course with because of which in most investor portfolios while you would see a decent allocation to a low volatility factor right. you could see a decent allocation to even a value factor the allocation to a momentum factor may perhaps be very low or even if it is there it could come because the one is invested in certain growth companies growth and momentum are not the same thing they are conflated to be the be one and the same but actually they are not they, there is differences between the two uh so you may uh, and we actually did this exercise where we looked at the data for all the mutual funds uh that are currently trading and we looked at what kind of factor exposure they would be owning right and this is of course a theoretical exercise so it's there's no correct okay. answer that this is the exact exposure that they'd be owning but it's like a close approximation and we found that the momentum factor was that particular factor where there was least ownership oh i would have actually guessed the opposite 
yeah it is actually the factor which has the least mm-hmm. ownership and you would be surprised but low volatility was actually one of the factors which had the highest ownership of course mutual fund because it's a mutual fund the highest factor is the market right. factor so you of course have high exposure to the market factor but then the next highest was low volatility and momentum was the least in terms of exposure across broad based categories right so whether it was large cap mid cap multi cap flexi cap whatever it is so by nature and, and i think someone who's a fundamental manager right if you want to talk to a fundamental manager who's not a quant uh they may acknowledge the existence of momentum but they will never invest based on it yeah i mean you don't want to be labeled right. as a momentum it's a, it has a very negative connotation in the exactly market. exactly it has a negative connotation and it's uh, and it perhaps will ha- start having a positive connotation once there are a few success stories which come out of it uh, but until then a fundamental manager if you call them a momentum manager they of course take offense to it they feel and, insulted yeah. exactly so uh as a result they they at least at the outset they may not do it closet in a closeted manner they may still do it but at least data doesn't show that they do it like that so got it uh, yeah i think some of these things will persist purely on account of you know enough money being managed by people who don't really believe in the strategy got it now i want to tie uh, you know everything that we have spoken uh, including the fact that we discussed two more, two factors and there are two more factors which i'll pick the brains of your colleague uh, in another conversation but for now right. Uh, right so my first question would be for example we discussed low volatility and momentum and you also mentioned that these factors don't work always in the sense that they are cyclical so and i'm guessing the macro economic environment will have an impact on how these factors perform if so like what factors perform well during what economic cycle i'm i'm thinking you know expansion contraction stagflation or 100 other shunts so when do these factors work and when don't they work uh so again this is backward looking right because uh you for the first thing is if you want to time factors you need to be able to time markets whether it is the economy or the market cycle in itself you is, need to be able to time that by the way is that a good idea But, timing factors uh i have mixed views to be honest i uh, timing factors from the view point of timing markets maybe not so much right uh, timing factors by using some you know nuance indicator of valuation or momentum itself right. may perhaps work because the same thing which works for the companies should also work for factors like it's essentially saying something is so damn cheap ah uh, okay as a combination that like it it's a no brainer that you should buy it but maybe it can be a no brainer and you may end up buying it but it may stay like that for a period of time you don't okay. know so maybe you combine that or overlay that with momentum and things like that and so i honestly have mixed views about it i'm not completely sold that factors are timeable but if you had asked me this question 6 months ago i would have said they are not timeable got it at least in the last 6 months whatever work i have done i feel that there is maybe some element of timing that can be done got it uh, i am definitely not the expert there but i am trying to learn my way through right uh, and i i don't see anyone who's publicly you know publicized that they have successfully timed it outside yeah. of academic i'm talking about practitioners <laughs> practitioners are not uh, sure. of course in academic papers you, you can get anything yeah right? everything works right yeah so uh, i don't know yet the answer is that uh, but it's a definitely an interesting question to you know keep thinking about as to if there is some timing feature that's available correct coming to your specific question on macroeconomic regimes and whether factors work like that right i am not sold as much because first of all there are very few data points if you look at the us from 1930 i think onwards right. until 2022 there were about 11 periods which could be called inflation inflationary periods got it so what analysis do you do out of those 11 periods right Makes you sense. so even in even if a factor does well in 11 out of 11 does it mean that your hit rate is 100% i don't think so because the data point your universe of you know relevant data is very low right and even in that there were very few factors which had a 100% per, uh, persistence of being able to beat the market right right Uh, but in general what i found was that in an inflationary period if you took a average of all the factors basically invested across these factors there was a much higher persistence of being able to do better than the benchmark so if at all you want to time factors and say which factor to invest during inflation i would flip it around and say if at all you want to do it and want to take exposure to factor take exposure to all factors during inflation don't prefer one over the other god uh that's one part of the problem the second part of the problem is 
most of these macroeconomic conditions don't reside by themselves right they reside as a combination of 10 other things which are working in uh, you know collusion right so uh, inflation which is caused today may be caused because on account of war and on account of supply chain shortages whereas an inflation which is caused maybe last time would have been demand side issues uh, on the demand side and the demand side could be perpetuated by something else the supply side could be perpetuated by something else the action on uh, taken to cu- curb inflation may work in a certain way in a certain economic regime and may not work in the same way in a different economic regime so i'm better off ignoring the as um, when i say i am as a retail investor i'm better off ignoring the macro noise and just stick to i i would think so i would think so. uh it also uh, you made an interesting point saying that in the sense that you are better off sticking to factors and buying them all which you know which comes to the question of asset allocation with factors uh so there are let's assume that there are five standard factors that everybody agrees so how does that work in an asset allocation framework so one of course and so how do i go about because if i mix everything i stand the risk of factor exposure cancelling each other out and maybe i'm just in, uh, i just end up with the market exposure does that happen or theoretically it shouldn't happen theoretically essentially think about it like every factor a combination of market plus something which is on top okay. of the market okay now if you add up five factors you get the market exposure five times but you also get that incremental portion of each of those got it which by design at least is expected to be not correlated among themselves okay so on account of that you get some diversification of the residual amount which adds up over time and which adds up so for let's say 40% of your portfolio is comprised of that uh, unique factor that 40% is different for every single factor exposure that you take your overall portfolio will be 40% different from the broader market and that 40% may actually be very very well diversified because you are essentially capturing different elements of and these are factors which have given you on performance right so you believe those factors will work so there are five elements which you believe will work over time right which you have exposure to and you have exposure to the broader market. so i don't think you get the market back if you just average all the factors but it i think is also important how you add the factors so there are uh, and i have certain views on how one does it and goes about doing it because one way is to buy single factor funds and then average it which i think is a reasonable way the other so, approach I'm is sorry, uh, yeah so when you say single factors and average it does it mean i just buy let's say five factor funds and maybe do an equal weighted approach and yeah, i would think so I, i would think so i would think so right if if you are doing something more strategic where you're giving a weightage to a particular factor and maybe you know have someone like an alt manager uh, right. do it for you maybe they have a process and then that is uh, that works so that's fine but there there is also certain you know off the shelf kind of structures which give fa- uh, weightages to different factor scores and you average out the factor score so factor score is actually the metric which you measure and then you rank based on that metric so you basically average out the scores for every company for every different factor based on certain weighting and then you get the company with the top weight in a multi factor portfolio i am not a huge fan of that approach because i feel over there what ends up happening is a factor which is ranked high on a particular fa- uh, particular factor company which is ranked high on a particular factor is highly likely to get ranked low in another factor because these are non correlated ah so the complementarity of the exposures in between the stocks yeah exactly so uh, you may end up getting companies which are right. in between and now there is a body of research which says that the companies in between don't really make so much sense in terms of giving you the factor exposures the extremities are really the ones which contribute to the right. results so if you are not able to if you miss out on the extremities on account of this averaging of scores then i think it gets you back to the market in some way uh then i think it doesn't make sense to combine factors Got it. so this this leads to my next question which was this question about uh, you know multi factor approach and of course academic literature uh, there is a lot of debate but at least the most recent literature says that the uh, you know it might not really work and the returns at least in the us context have been extremely disappointing at least in the multi factor space so uh could it be a reasonable take away that i am better off not mixing factors and, and at least uh, you know for the investors in india there are no multi factor funds as of yet uh but even if there were hypothetically am i better off not mixing them in a single fund and maybe just uh, allocating in individual funds and tilting whatever uh, however i want it 
Uh, I know it's a very difficult question and there is no really easy answer. Yeah, uh, yeah, there's no easy answer to be honest. And uh, again, if someone feels strongly about a part- construction of a factor in a certain way, right, and they have justification economically for it right. as to why they have combined it in that certain way, and they feel that they have a uh, alpha of maybe half a percent that they can give right. just because of the process which they follow, which someone else can't follow. And someone, most of the investors perhaps also don't la- don't have the discipline to continuously rebalance across the factors, uh, take exposure to the factors, get the weights back to what the target weights were and so on. Uh, in those scenarios, taking exposure to a multi-factor fund may make sense. But, uh, you know, I run a multi-factor fund, so I will not definitely talk <laughs> ill about someone else who's also doing it. But uh, the point being, uh, uh, I, I think that India as a market is uh, fairly like fairly conducive to be running a factor strategy in whether it is in a single factor right. uh, through a single factor approach or a multi factor approach because there are so few people who are actually thinking about this space and so few people who are actually taking it seriously that uh, just by virtue of it not being crowded as yet there is alpha to be generated i feel but uh, as opposed to the US where there was so much crowding, which uh, right, right, right. Uh, has happened in the factor space. And uh, you would be surprised, but even now, uh, I was just looking at some data. The second most popular category in the US, ETF space, right. Okay, after the broad-based benchmark is factors, even today. Wow. Like 30% of all incremental flows have gone into factors even today. Wow. Right. Yeah, I mean, thinking about the Indian context, that's not even probably 0.1%. Exactly. Exactly. And this is a space which has already crossed a trillion dollars. Right. 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 So it is an immensely crowded space. It is more crowded than sectors. It is more, it is perhaps as, it is right after your broad-based benchmark, I think there is no other space which is as crowded. So I would expect the return shrinkage to happen and it has not just happened in the ETF space or the mutual fund space. The best guys, AQRs of the world have underperformed over a period of time. Right, right, right. Uh, so at least from the Indian context, I think we aren't, uh, we wouldn't be so worse off selecting one or the other, uh, at least now. Once it gets popular and there is a, you know, UTI momentum fund, which is now at 15, <laughs> 1600 crore, uh, right. which, which can go up fairly quickly depending on how markets are and maybe the low volatility fund picks up who you never know once it becomes like a 50,000 crore category uh, at that point in time maybe we'll have to start thinking of at that point in time the first level of thinking will happen as to how to optimize your exposures the second yeah. level will perhaps happen at 1 lakh crore right. and the the third level will be when all the alpha goes away so I think it's it, a whole new meaning to growing pains <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly got it um, to the earlier point, again, to my promise of about asking dumb questions. So it is, it is clear now that there is some premium to be had by allocating to factors. So does this mean I ignore everything else and go all in on factors and just wake up after 15 years and, you know, start deciding what do I do with all the money that I've made? Uh, wouldn't be a, wouldn't be the worst idea to do that. <laughs> uh, honestly, uh, like, right. Uh, but if, if, if someone could, you know, do it, maybe market plus all the factors would be a great idea because at the end of the day, if nothing else, they offer the promise of lower fees, right? Got it. Uh, so when you say market, you mean the broad based index, broad funds, based like index nifty, exactly. 50 or nifty. Exactly. Exactly. Got it. exactly. exactly. If someone is uh, down to investing in that manner. Uh, it might not be the worst approach because, uh, you know, uh, there is this arbitrage in terms of be, uh, charging lower fees as compared to right. a more actively managed fund. Uh, outside of that, I think, uh, yeah, I think from that perspective, it makes sense to do that. But uh, most investors who are that kind of investors are, you know, perhaps the, an even better strategy is to just allocate to the index fund and not do anything else. Uh, I mean, this is probably the best advice that has worked across <laughs> centuries. Yeah. Um, I want to come back to two points when you made. So, uh, so the earlier point that you made about you guys looking at some data of mutual fund managers and the factor exposures. Uh, so in the initial conversation, you mentioned that before all this, you know, shindig about factors being present, everything was alpha basically. Uh, but today, thanks to all the tools, all the data we have, 
uh, it is abundantly clear that most of the active fund mutual fund returns can be explained by their respective allocations to factors and by okay. this just for the people out there i mean let's say for example a fund manager has delivered 10 percent above nifty and 10 percent is generally considered as alpha but if you go and look at what kind of factor exposures he had and looking at this takes some statistical analysis but assume that you were to do it you would probably discover that fund manager was overweight low volatility momentum value something like that so does that mean that factor funds which are basically factor index funds which are low cost funds are a better replacement for active funds and i know you guys run active <laughs> funds so i'm putting you on the spot right so let us look at it this way right so aqr actually wrote a paper uh, called buffett's alpha Ah, yeah, one yeah. of my favorites. Yeah, so what they essentially did over there was they tried to decompose returns of Warren Buffett uh, over the last, his life track record basically. And said that most of his exposure comes from taking food to the market, betting against beta, uh, QMJ, and value, right? right. Essentially, uh, so profitability, high profitable, low beta, undervalued companies, uh, and taking broad-based market exposure is essentially what has led to 95% of his returns and 5% is because of his skill, his ability to take float at a very low cost and deploy that, take leverage and all those things, right? The problem is, uh, this looks good on paper, but Warren Buffett actually had the ability to stay the course over a period of 50, 60, 70 years, 100 years, whatever time frame that he's going to eventually be known for, right? Uh, so that takes enormous, uh, you know, how would I put it? So it's, it's easier said than done. So if, of course, if you're an index investor and so there was no vehicle out there, which would give you that exposure back then. Right. Okay. And if you're an index fund manager, uh, or you, you know, these days the, the vogue is to be a quant fund manager where you have a model and then the model, uh, you know, tells you what to allocate and so on. So your mandate is not to take those active calls, but for someone who does not, is not bound by any of those mandates to have the discipline to be invested in that manner, be consistent in their philosophy and do that over, you know, multiple decades is what makes Warren Buffett great. And that is what would make a phenomenal fund manager also great is that they are able to stick to their conviction. And also to flip it around, maybe they have some ability with respect to changing the allocations in a more timely manner. Right. Right. So I wouldn't say one can exist completely without the other. It's complementary. So uh, that balance needs to be maintained. It needs to be complemented. Uh, and I, I, I don't want to dish on, uh, <laughs> you know, active discretionary right. fund managers not being able to do a good job. I think even if they are their performance is explained by factors, I think there's nothing wrong. It's uh, if someone can you know, uh, at an individual DIY level, do it themselves at a much lower or a fraction of the cost, then great, they should do that. But for the majority of the population, which is not able to do that and does not have the discipline to do that, the active shop is, uh, or the discretionary shop is still right. Uh, so one, one thing I want to reiterate on and just to get, you know, re-emphasize is, is because throughout the conversation, we made it abundantly clear there is some premium to be had and if a retail investor is listening to this, his mind is already made array factors may lag up paisa and I'm already rich. Uh, but Correct. factors are cyclical, right? In the sense that set the expectation, like what expectation should I as an investor have when I'm allocating to factor funds? And what are like, is it, is it going to be smooth sailing just because India has, you know, very limited uh, AUM in this funds or I'm in for a world of pain? Absolutely not. I think uh, we are in for a world of pain if we go in with that expectation because uh, you look at value factor, right? Uh, across history, between value and momentum, both of those factors have been a head and shoulders above right. most of the other factors. And the market, the alpha that these factors have generated in the last 100 years have been phenomenal. Absolutely. It's to the tune of 5, 6, 7, 8 percentage annualized returns compounding over 100 years, right? But, uh, and we, uh, I already, we already discussed that uh, in India, these funds don't really exist. But if you look at take up, take out the returns of any value index in the Indian context in the last 15 years, yeah, it's nuts. <laughs> uh, you are in for a world of pain. These factors have underperformed. Right. They have just in because of the recent run up. I think when we looked at the data as of June, uh, over a 15 year time frame, they had given the same returns as the benchmark. Got it. 
by taking 1.5 times more volatility or risk as compared to the benchmark that's crazy right so if someone goes in with the expectation that you know factor fund is you know going to uh, lead to a win at all points in time then you are going to be in for a nasty surprise the momentum fund which all of us love uh, had a drawdown which it took i think 3 years to get out of a relative drawdown vis a vis the benchmark which it took 3 years to get out of in the limited history of data which we have in india that's nuts <laughs> so, right and uh, we could so someone who had invested in the momentum fund in january 2022 would have been underwater vis a vis the benchmark by at least 10 percentage and it's going to take ages to cover that up got it right so there are going to be these pains which happen which may happen for a very short period of time like a quarter or two quarters it may happen for much longer periods of time as well it may happen for 1 2 3 years it just that if you are an investor for 3 years 4 years 5 years maybe even longer 7 years 10 years you improve your odds of success got it it doesn't mean that you will 100% make money but you may end up making money 99% of the time right. and that's a good odd to be entering a trade with makes sense that's essentially how i would look at it got it now you know i want to close book on the factor part of the conversation and now ask a little bit about uh, you know some personal questions so how do you personally invest what's your overarching investing philosophy if i may ask right so uh, i am limited largely by uh, because of all uh, <laughs> compliance related issues on how active i can get with single names uh but so as a result i have to invest through funds right so i i would uh, most likely i would uh, allocate so a little bit of timing which i told you i have not seen lot of success in timing right. but i i have tried to uh, allocate opportunistically to uh, you know the mid cap space through mutual funds or uh, to large cap phase again through mutual funds depending on various market levels it's not some great insight which i have gleaned through some fancy models which i have built wait you are telling uh, me you are a fund manager and you suck at market timing come on you are you must be lying yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so i i got lucky a couple of times to be honest uh, and i got uh, uh, entries and exits at good levels but uh, my track record with respect to market timing is sketchy to say the least Uh, I have I a Telegram to... group, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Please continue. <laughs> yeah. So I want to move more towards, uh, you know, trying to uh, allocate more and more systematically. Uh, maybe focus more on allocation uh, across different asset classes. Again, also rather than you know having a more naive approach to life, where I say I will allocate 60% or 70% or 80% of equities and the balance to you know fixed income or gold or whatever. I want to see if uh, I can allocate using some model, uh, which I myself have been testing for a period of time. But uh, yeah, right. Uh, that's my at least my longer term philosophy is to do it like that till the time I don't get there. Uh, I do most of my investments either through. So the active uh, bit is you know selecting what segment of the market to invest in. Right. Uh, but once that has been selected, mostly it is through. Uh, if, if an index fund is available then i buy the index fund in that category if the index fund is not available then i buy a mutual fund which is which has complementary uh, exposure you know a large size sort of complementary in that category so it's essentially it's like that it's very unexciting uh, got it yeah but i think one of the first lessons which i learned when i came over to the buy side and actually slightly earlier also uh, is that a lot of people give you this statement that you can make 2% a month 3% a month if you manage your own money i realized very quickly that that's not right. true uh, at least i can't do that <laughs> so i'm 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 better off uh, earning lot lesser but with the peace of mind that uh, i don't need to keep tracking sgx i still do that at times but <laughs> I, i don't have to keep doing that every right. night and waking up every morning it's a very stressful way to live <laughs> Got yeah it. so what are some of your favorite books that have kind of shaped your thinking and also some of some other investors you mentioned cliff fastness that you look up to uh books investors that you look up to yeah so uh, i'm a fan of aqrs i like uh, everything that they put out i think the communication is very good um uh, i like a company called alpha oh, yeah, west gray and the, the person called west gray yeah uh, so they west gray has actually written two books quantitative value quantitative momentum i i read both of those i i, I would recommend that for anyone who wants to get introduced to this whole world of quant investing actually uh, even before that there's a book called little book that beats the market joel uh, greenblatt by joel greenblatt that's i think the first book uh, anyone who's in, interested in doing anything related to factors should perhaps look at 
it it's less to do with factors and more to do with the uh, you know gumption to stay the course and so they make he makes it abundantly clear why it is difficult so there is no magic formula is what he says which is of course right. the case right there is no magic formula but uh, the magic formula is your gumption your perseverance in staying to uh, you know attuned to the course and so on uh other investors who i uh, so i i actually uh, my reading interests are a bit diverse so uh, more the merrier please go ahead i i yeah so i like to read about volatility uh, from a derivative standpoint right uh, because uh, so i am interested and intrigued by some of the mathematical concept that go behind it so ivan sinclair has written couple of books on volatility which i which i i like also and i also would recommend to people who would want to do something in the space i i am also intrigued by uh, uh so tail hedging which uh, you know it's of course something that we also try to do in our fund but uh, the concepts of tail hedging the underlying principles behind it so there uh, there is this person called mark spitznagel right, right, right. who's uh, written couple of books uh, so one is the austrian a uh, way of investing or austrian economics which is called the dow of capital and the other is uh, which is this most recent book which is safe haven right uh, so i i'm i'm reading that i have not completed it till the end and uh, so i think those are, those are interesting reads for me uh going out of uh, finance and the world of investing into uh, you know one book which i want to read which is on my wish list is seven brief lessons in physics uh can uh, well so i've heard yeah Yeah, so I have heard a lot about it. I I have been recommended it by a lot of people. Right. So I that's something that I would want to. That's completely. I don't know if it. Uh, I will take any anything away from it which directly links back to investing. But right. you know, uh, what the heck, right? Got it. So, <laughs> and I I like to read uh, financial history, which is uh, you know events which shaped the financial world, whether it was the LTCM, whether it was. Uh, Uh, you know the nabisco merger by kkr whatever uh, so uh, lbo sorry so i think I, i i like to i like to also read that the whole 80s era is what actually got got me hooked into the world of investing oh, that was the wild so west was, of finance <laughs> yeah it was the wild west of the west so right. <laughs> yeah so but it was exciting times to be you know a banker or investment manager at those times so i i like to read about it just to see the kind of excesses that these guys actually had and uh, you know so yeah i think uh, broadly yeah, those, those are some of the books which i am reading looking forward to read one reading. final question um, like going back to the place where we started the conversation and if you were to look back at your own career and how it has evolved like for budding people who want to enter into the world of finance do you have any small uh, career tips so uh whether it is so i'll answer it in two parts the first part is if you want to enter into finance and the second part would be if you want to enter into quant finance right. you know so finance is uh, at, so at least when i was graduating finance was perhaps the most popular uh, place to get into after you know b school especially uh, and most of the guys who were doing engineering back then uh, you know typically got jobs in software companies didn't care too much about it uh did their mbas passed out and or took a switch over to a finance job and most of the guys who had spent too much time in tech could not get into finance because there was a threshold in terms of how many years of experience you would have had prior to you know your mba so they would have a cap on that uh and working at goldman working at uh, so mostly funds would not typ- typically get peop- uh, hire people right off the campus but Uh, places like goldman uh, places like ms would hire people from campus uh, and working in those places was glorified a lot and people used to you know look up to people who slogged up from 9 am to 4 am and then went back again the next day at 9 am but i think those days are long gone people don't want or appreciate that kind of lifestyle and uh, covid has given perspective to a lot of people that uh, that kind of work work style is not amenable not sustainable in the long run and definitely not something that they want to do right so uh, and plus the whole tech way which hit not just uh, the west but also india in a big way meant that lot of the guys are now going to uh, the tech roles right so to speak 
So if someone wants to get into finance, it perhaps not as unidirectional as it used to be when I graduated where, you know, but an engineer, uh, even even if from, you know, an IIT or an NIT uh, would have to go to a B school uh, and would have to get placed in a finance company and that would pretty much be the only way. A lot of guys now, what they're doing is they're reaching out to people right. in the industry, uh, asking for internships. Uh, stacking up a couple of internships. So these will, these would be internships which they would do even right. while they are studying. And some people would, you know, if they are on a career break and they just want to test it out, they even those guys are open to doing internships. And pe- uh, even um, uh, companies are open to taking people on board just to give people a flavor of what can, what the business is all about and so on. Uh, so, uh, you know, the traditional path still exist to an MBA, get finance, whatever. But even guys who don't have the traditional background, uh, you can network your way through uh, and get into uh, an in- initial role and then you can build your way from there. If you specifically want to get into quant finance, because I feel that's an area which will see a lot more uh, growth in the coming times. Uh, it would perhaps not be as easy for someone who's starting out now as it was for me, because, uh, you know, I just happened to be at a place where not a lot of people were doing it. So I got it. But uh, uh, now, I think a lot of people are going ahead and doing specialization courses. They're doing their master's in financial engineering. They do, are doing their master's in quant finance. They're taking these certification courses. Uh, or they're, uh, you, you know, there's this uh, company in Bombay which gives the offers a certification called EPAT or something like that. So, people do that. So, that gives a good, all these courses, what they do is they give you a good understanding of the, or a lay of the land of what quant investing or quant uh, based roles are all about. So I would recommend someone who's, uh, you know, interested in doing quant finance as a career, pursuing quant finance, irrespective of whether it's on the buy or the sell side, uh, to at least look up some of these resources, uh, talk to people in this space and try to see how they can kind of move ahead in this. Uh, because especially in quant investing, as in investing in general is not a very broad area uh, in terms of the number of people that are employed in it. Uh, so there are fewer people who are employed as a result there are fewer opportunities and if more and more people are interested in it and as it is we churn out the most number of engineers most engineers are good at coding so they can do quant finance right and they they they, they may they, they may even be able to do a good job so uh, for people like those the opportunity so there are fewer opportunities so if you really need to stand out in the crowd you need to have something which gives you a one or two level deeper understanding of the space that you want to enter into as opposed to someone who just has good coding skills. So I think uh, those were, those would be some of the, I, I wouldn't necessarily say learn a whole lot of, so there's this person whom I follow in, uh, on LinkedIn called Vivek Vishwanathan. He, he runs a fund called Radiant Global, uh, which does factor investing in China. But they sit in the US, but they do funds which invest in China. So, yeah, and he's a, uh, I think he's a finance PhD or something. And then he eventually went on to become a quant. What he said was, if he had to go back 10 years and, you know, redo his entire career, uh, he would take coding more seriously and he would perhaps de-emphasize on the finance education or the finance learning, which I can resonate to a lot now, because I feel that if someone, I were to hire someone in my team, uh, I could, to some extent, right teach them whatever I know about finance. But if they can, they are fantastic coders, if they can execute codes, which, and they can run like, and write and run really complicated uh, algorithms, uh, then I think three fourths of my job is already done. I just need to tell them, I just need to give them a problem definition and that will be solved. So I think that's an easier hurdle for a lot of people to start accepting newer people and hiring newer people. So, uh, yeah, so I think uh, for someone who's on the, you know, uh, who's already a coder, maybe trying to be a great coder, trying to learn machine learning techniques, because I think th- those are the things which are going to uh, be more important as we move forward in the future. Uh, might be a good ways to kind of enter the space. This has been an absolute market class on, you know, all things quantitative finance. I really, really appreciate you taking out the time to, you know, explain on all these concepts at length. Uh, I have an insane amount. Of, I, it feels like I did a mini PhD. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, I'm I'm pretty sure you know all the people who are listening to this will have some fantastic takeaways from this entire conversation. Thanks, thanks, Bhuvan. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you, and some of the questions uh, were absolutely fantastic. And uh, it it felt like uh, you know I was 
Uh, I I hopefully was able to add. No, it was absolutely brilliant. And I'm I'm pretty sure I'll I'll bug you for one more conversation sometime later down the line when there are more interesting developments in the markets. Absolutely. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Please read all the scheme-related documents carefully before making investment decisions. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as a basis for investment. The views and opinions expressed by the guests. and the hosts are solely their own and do not reflect the views and opinions of the organizations that they work for please consult your financial advisor before making any investment decisions